He said, be brave, my son, I'll be home soon. The boy held on to hope till he got that awful news. And as they folded up the stars and stripes, 21 guns pointed towards the sky. As the shots rang out, he flinched a little each time. Then a soldier in his best dress walked up to him, and you know the rest. This show is brought to you by Operation Encore. Operation Encore is a 501c nonprofit that is helping change the lives of our veteran community. Let me tell you a little bit about what they do. They are helping veterans get into the music industry. They're helping them learn the business, get songs recorded, and not only that, making dreams happen. You know, most of these veterans have got the idea of becoming a a musician way before they went into the military. And Operation Encore is filling that gap from while they served in the military and helping them change their lives and live out those dreams. Operation Encore is a nonprofit. You can go to this link right there and click on it. Give them a little help. Hit that donate button. Follow them. Learn about all the great things that Operation Encore does for our veterans. Hey, welcome everybody to Spirits and Stories. This is your host, Donald Dunn. You know, another one of my favorite episodes is coming up. We're going to talk about the paranormal. I absolutely love talking about the unknown. Um, Not to mention, this gentleman is also an author. And since I have just released my first book, I, I find it interesting to talk to other authors. So let's introduce Ron Millis. Is a native Clevelander residing in Columbus. I hope he doesn't hold it against me because I got a bangled chair that I sit in. But uh, he is residing in Columbus, Ohio. He is the former host of an internet paranormal radio show and has always been interested in the weird, strange, and paranormal. In 2004, Ron released a supernatural fiction novel titled Healers. And in the midst of the 2021 COVID pandemic, Ron released an updated paperback version of Healers, Three Tales of Miracles, Angels, and Lost Souls. Let's bring on Ron. There we go. Donald? Hey, how's it going? Uh, okay. All right, Good, man. good. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Oh, uh, no, I'm not going to be too mad at you. It's uh, at the Bengals, but I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and went to yeah. Columbus for work. So I'm not going to be too mad at you. If you okay. you're in the Steelers here, I might be mad at you. I I would be mad at myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do kind of live right now in the best place to be a Bengals fan, and I live near Kansas City, so. So the Bengals are doing good against Oma Holmes. So I'll take it. I'll take it. So let's get into a little bit. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself and, and where you grew up and, and how did you get into the radio and the paranormal? Uh, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, born and raised there. Uh, left for Columbus, you know, for a job. Um, was a social worker for 32, 33 years. You have to excuse my voice. I'm getting over a little bout of COVID. <coughs> and um, so went there for a job. Pretty much stayed uh, stayed for a long time. So <laughs> in Columbus. <laughs> working. Um, I've always really, really been interested in the paranormal. As a kid, I remember, you know, I watched In Search of with Leonard Nimoy, uh, Love Star Trek. Yep. Um, I, one of the first things I want to stay up and see, uh, this is when in the TV, the three big TV stations, ABC, NBC, 
and uh, what's the other one? CBS. Yeah, CBS. They um they had to they would make movies for you know movies of the week for their mm-hmm. station. And I saw one evening, you know, was coming up was the UFO incident, and it had um, James Earl Jones and Estelle Parsons in it, and it's about Betty and Barney Hill, the UFO incident mm-hmm. when they were, you know, captured and taken in a UFO. And I think I, I don't know how it was this 1975. Uh, I was young then. I was like, so I think I was 13 or something. Uh, 12 day my mom is that let me stay up let me stay up let me stay up you know <laughs> i want to see this i want to see it I'm begging her so yeah okay okay you can stay up and watch it you know she said but it, she thought i'd be asleep anyway so I went all the way to 11 o'clock i was wide awake you know, <laughs> just mesmerized by the whole thing you know this is really true you know and i'm thinking to myself you know it was just amazing so i've always been interested in the weird, the strange, and the paranormal. And um, when I got to when I got to Columbus, um, I did a little. I was bringing these guys in that had a show called The Chosen on Talk Tainment Radio. This some podcasts were getting and their emphasis and getting big. Mm-hmm. So these other four, these other four guys, were supposed to be introduced. And they're supposed to be doing a two-hour thing talking about the paranormal. And I did some of the ins and outs and stuff. You know, we'll be right back with the chosen. You know, and um, they were they they just talked among themselves. They didn't really have any guests. Mm-hmm. And I'm a guy that listened to Coast to Coast, and I was like, why don't they get any guests? You know, I'm thinking to myself. And I did get them their first guest, and their first guest was Howard Storm, and he wrote a book by Descent into Hell. And he mm-hmm. talked about having a near-death experience and not going to a nice place. He went to hell. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he became a pastor after the whole incident. So I got him to come on the show, you know, because he was, he, was, he was running a church in Ohio. So they didn't really do their due diligence to do their research or anything. Mm-hmm. So I was asking most of the questions and everything. So, and they, they kind of like, just, they would, they just didn't do enough research. They didn't seem to take it serious to me. Right. So then they, uh, we had a meeting and stuff like that, you know, and I wanted to get other show hosts and stuff, to show people to come in and talk about their their incidents and everything. So it's just kind of relegate me again, just do the ins and outs and stuff. You're listening to The Chosen, heard only on Talk Tame and Radio. <laughs> so they had a meeting one time, and because I wanted to get somebody else. I had a meeting, and the guy who kind of owned the studio and stuff, well, they didn't show up. You know, I guess they're mad at you or something like that. They didn't show up. I don't know if they're going to show up for the show. We're not going to have a show tonight. I guess they were protesting me. He said, <laughs> you want to take over the show and do it yourself? And I said, oh, my God, I was waiting for you to ask me. You know? <laughs> so five years I was doing that. I think from 2008 and stuff, you know, five years I was doing it. And it's, I said, it's going to be guest driven. Uh, Jess, I'm not going to. Because it. When you did have a guest, the way they question the guest is that, you know, we don't, only thing we truly know is what we don't know. Yeah. How many times have we thought somebody was crazy and they weren't, you know, and that's what the audience to decide. You just ask the questions, you know, yeah. and you go from there. And he was like, well, you know, what are the things that you want to do there and stuff? And I was like, time travel, cryptozoology, spontaneous human combustion. <laughs> <laughs> Secrets, uh, religion, strange religions, government conspiracies, alien abductions. I wanted to do it all. Ghost, uh, ghost apparitions, shadow people, haunted places. You know, so yeah. I started getting guests, and it was you know I was working on getting guests at first, and then they kind of came to me. You know, books are coming and stuff, and mm-hmm. and so you know. 
every Monday, I was there Monday nights, you know, with guests. And so it turned from there. And it really, the guests I wanted, because I wanted to learn from them. I wanted to learn what they know. Yeah. And my tagline was, doubt if you dare, but believe if you have the courage, because you're listening to the chosen, you know, and I was <laughs> really into it, you know, and <laughs> you got a kid. A lot of tons of books from people and stuff mm -hmm. and the people that I heard on uh, coast to coast. And I said, I just wanted to do it like that. I want to learn as much as I could. So, yeah, look at, at the end of the day, um, I had a guest on and I haven't released that episode yet, but uh, I had a guest on and he's really big into the paranormal as well. And he yeah. said something on there that, that really made sense. Right. At the end of the day, none of us know anything about ghosts and, and stuff like that until we die up mm -hmm. until then everything's a theory mm -hmm. and so unless you are out there interacting with other people and taking in information it's going to be hard for you to to base that theory and, and kind of mold it um, because at the end of the day you need other people's encounters and perspectives and and everything else because the truth is you know we're not going to know until we die what's on the other side and I do personally believe, um, you know, I was telling him on that show that uh, at the end of the day, when my dad had passed, before we buried him, I seen him standing by a window. And uh, to this day, I'll still swear on that. And then I haven't seen him since, you know. And so I, I do believe in the paranormal. I do believe that we're not the only existence in the world. And I also believe, believe that the human mind has got a whole lot more potential than what mm -hmm. we're using. So I do believe in things like psychics and, you know, levitation and, and stuff like that. So, so absolutely. That is the best way to learn. Just like you said, having guests on and, and creating conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I had a couple of paranormal experiences and this building I was in, it was haunted. And this before I got to Columbus and before I was introduced to the show and everything. Um, I was staying in this building and it was a building probably in the 1920s and they converted it to apartments. They had like a marble floor. It had the one I was in, they made them efficiencies. It had a Murphy bed in there. It had a Murphy bed at the wall. So I was like, when okay. I moved in there, like it even had a mattress. I said, I'm not going to sleep on that thing. I was like, <laughs> I was thinking the, the three stooges, you get in it, goes up, you get trapped in the wall. Yeah. It had a queen size or a full size Murphy bed in there. So I would hear just like somebody walking in the hall. I hear shoes, you know, because they had like these marble floors. I look out there, it stopped, nothing. I said, yeah, that's unusual. So well, the thing that really scared me is I had a futon on, you know, I said a futon I was going to pick up. Mm -hmm. I said, I got to get somebody to help me get this futon because, like I said, I'm not going to sleep on that Murphy bed. But I said, I have anything to sleep on, put a sheet over the the mattress and stuff. And I said, well, I can sleep on it tonight. Pulled it down. So you could see this whole apartment. There are like five windows. There's the mm -hmm. bathroom and a kitchenette. So from the living room where you're sitting, you can see the whole apartment. So I'm laying there, the door's locked, and I feel like somebody sitting on the edge of the bed, and they lay next to me with their back turned to me. And my first thing in the neighborhood, and I said, somebody broke in. And I said, this idiot is going to lay on the bed next to me, you know. And I'm getting prepared to turn around and fight whoever it is. I'm like, you know, I'm just, my heart's beating out of my chest. I said, this is on the edge of the bed. I said, this is crazy. And it's like they're laying on the bed. I turn around and it's the impression of somebody on the bed. And it leaves the bed like the weight and everything. Wow. And my, my heart was about to jump on my chest. And I was like, you know, it's trembling. <laughs> and... I did not. I just sat in the chair. I didn't get back and lift up that Murphy bed. And I said, 
I don't know whose bed that is, but I'm not laying on it anymore. <laughs> I got the food time the next day. And I would wait till the sun came up. I've never seen anything like that before. And yeah. The place was haunted. So. And, yep. I, and I, I do. I, about that too. Yeah. I do believe it and all that stuff. You know, my wife, I never personally heard this, but my wife said in the house that we lived in for a, quite a while, every couple nights or so, she would hear somebody say mommy and then she'd feel a poke and she would get up and and go check on the kids kids were all asleep in their bed and she could never figure out where it came from and then just after i don't know six seven months or so of this it just quit and she hasn't heard it since and hasn't felt it again and i i never heard it but you know I, I I don't know. Maybe it was just the mama instincts in her, or maybe it was something. I don't know. But the, there's another, all sorts of weird stuff. Another thing happened in that apartment. I was um I was working a job that you know like an extra job. I get there mm-hmm. late at night on the food time before I, you know made it flat, <laughs> turn it from her couch to bed, and. I was falling asleep on the food time with the TV on. And I heard somebody say my name. They said, Ron. And so I'm thinking, I'm falling asleep. It must be going into dream sleep. Yeah. And they said it again, Ron. I felt the breath on my ear. <laughs> I grabbed my ear and turned around. Just nothing there. Nothing there. <laughs> and I, when I left, I told the guy, I said, your apartment's haunted. And it's, it's haunted. It's haunted. Uh, well, it's just an old building. All I did was rehab it. But my theory with that, and I've had guests on and stuff, and they said that they said that you you might be trapped between dimensions because you've been told that you're going to go to hell. Certain religions tell you you're going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell. You know, and it's very confusing, and so you don't want to go for the retribution nobody's perfect but you think you're gonna go to hell and so you're trapped between those two worlds because you don't want to leave this one and go to the light and i had one person I was, yeah some people are afraid to go to light and i said well some people have been trapped for years and they said yeah i kind of lose their way to it and she she was like a psychic medium she, she said you know how i get them to go to light she said i have them follow me to the hospital she said, because you can't miss the light there. People are dying every day in the hospital. I said, I never thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I'll be coming in the hospital, she said, with the, you know several people behind me. Nobody could see them. You know, just like I'm strolling through the hospital or <laughs> going to get something to eat in the cafeteria. And they get to finally see the light, you know, because she said they can't find the light. So. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, yeah. when somebody told me that, I looked up and they said, you know, because my grandmother said as a child and stuff, uh, God loves you, but he's a jealous God and he'll he'll burn in a lake of fire forever. And I was I kind of confused as a kid. My mm-hmm. mother said, try to find the word hell in the Bible. It only appears one time. It's Gehenna, and it's outside. <laughs> Of Jerusalem, where they used to burn the tr- trash. There was a lake of fire because they, you, know, you didn't have a dump then. You had a dump, you burned the trash. Yeah. Outside Jerusalem, and that was a lake of fire to run through there. And, and it's, she, she said, pretty much, it's a human concept. And I said, I had thought about it. I said, why does God want revenge? You know, <laughs> it was like, that's a human concept. We want that. Yeah. And I asked her on the show, too. I said, do you think Hitler's in hell? Just as possibly he's not. I will tell you, I had a guest on, and she was a medium. And the way she described heaven, it, it just seems so true to me that I, I had no 
no choice but to kind of believe it. And and she she made this comment about how there's different dimensions of heaven. That it's not like, you know, you're not walking through the pearly gates and then poof, you're all among angels. She said there's dimensions to it. And and mm-hmm. how how you move up in those dimensions, she's not sure. Um, she said the only part she has seen is the fifth dimension, which is the very basic, the very beginning. And she said that there's a, a person there that uh, is not human that uh, kind of schools her and gives her info. And he also helps when people want to talk to somebody on the other side, he helps bring those people to her so that she can communicate. And I said, well, I said, so it, how is that like, like depending on how good you are? And she's like, I really don't know. She said, because I have, I have brought to, I've brought murderers, child molesters, all sorts of people to, um, able to talk. And she said, I cannot talk to anybody that's in hell. And she said that what I have learned from talking to the people on the other side is, is if you were a dick here, you're a dick there too, that it doesn't change. You just, who you are is who you are. And I was like, man, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it would make sense that there's different dimensions and and maybe what she's calling fifth dimension of heaven. Maybe it's not truly heaven. Maybe that's more like, you know, the, the holding area or, um, you know, just kind of the place that you're in between waiting to go wherever you're going to go. And uh, it does make a lot of sense the way she talked. You know, she had me convinced. I will admit that. I, I believe, and from the guests I've had and stuff, that, you know, I thought I probably would never, but you evolve. If you listen and then you kind of study, it's hard to let go of beliefs. And uh, I was baptized, and I'm of no religion now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> See? Yeah. And then when I say I have no religion, people say, you know, well, you don't believe in God. I said, oh, no, that's not true. I said, first of all, I call it the creator. Mm-hmm. So I can't give it a man's sex or a woman's sex. Right. I think it's far beyond that, whatever it is. I said, I just call it the creator. And I said, and you say, well, how can you believe in God? You don't have religions. I said, but religions are, when I had, um, Howard Storm on the show. And one thing he said, it was like, you know, he didn't believe in anything. And he just yelled when they were torturing him, whatever beans there was and stuff, torturing him and disemboweling him and everything. He yelled out for Jesus. And Jesus appeared and helped and he talked to him. And pretty much he said, what religion should I be? And he said, whichever one brings you closer to God. I I never believed as a kid that other religions were going to hell. I couldn't believe that. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, I couldn't believe that. That didn't make any sense to me. Because when anybody had the right thing, you know. So, And at a point where I was Catholic also, too, it was a thing it couldn't confuse. They said, you know, um, people that commit suicide going to hell. I can't believe that either, too. So, don't believe that either. She she had a comment about that too, and hey. it does make sense. Um, so what she said is is that the souls, which is your energy, right, mm-hmm. does get reincarnated. Right? That's what I believe in. That reincarnate. And, and she said that you pick lessons for yourself to learn. That's what I believe. Before you even get into the human body or, and it may not even be human, you know, you may be an alien or something else. Cause she said there, she said there is a creator and, and it's not about religion. She wasn't a religious person either that said that the Christianity is the right way, which I believe all religions are man wrote and they are exactly. all changed and, and translated in different ways. So mm-hmm. I do believe in a God. I believe that we're all praying to a same kind of God, creator, 
energy, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. But she said that the only thing that can change um, your plan is suicide. She said, all the way down to no matter what you do, you will not be able to deviate from your original plan that you made for yourself unless you decide to take your own life. They said, and she said that it, it talk, they talk about how you're supposed to die and everything else. And, uh, you know, when saying that it makes a lot of sense, you know, mm -hmm. because I can't imagine that anything, there's no normalcy to suicide, you know? And so I can't imagine that anybody would say, okay, in my next plan, I'm planning on hanging myself at the age of 26. You know, I just can't, I just, that doesn't make no sense to me, but it does make sense that plan, your plan can be changed in certain ways and suicide would definitely change it. You know, she did not say whether you go to heaven or hell. She did say there is a hell. She said she has not seen it and doesn't want to. Um, but she said how all this started for her was she committed suicide. And uh, when she went to the other side, that thing that I was, she was saying that has been teaching her just looked at her and said, it is not your time. You need to go back. Go back. Now, isn't, and I have a theory on that. Mm -hmm. Maybe what we're calling hell is the absence of being with the creator. I that would make sense. Yeah, the absence of I don't know. Yeah, and that might be my thought, but I definitely have evolved in reincarnation because one of the questions I asked when I was a Catholic, I said, you know, suicide's a mortal sin, right? Then how come Johnny can get a gun and shoot me and take in my mid? mission here on earth but i can't end it <laughs> that makes no sense to me how can yeah. he how does he get free will to end my mission and i'm not supposed to end it but he gets the ability to do it i had a guest on and i think it was, what's her name barbara lang i think and she had this thing like 16 or 16 signs or something like that to to get in his, figure out what your past life was. Mm -hmm. See, the things you say in jokingly gives you a clue. And I would say, you know, somebody would ask me and joke around, what are you doing? I said, is it, what are you doing? I said, well, it's a king in the past life. But I didn't get along with the people, didn't go get, get close to them, you know, and stuff. So there was, I said, there was a coup d'etat. And I end up in this life. <laughs> and when she said that, she said, think about the things and choices you made. I said, I grew up in the projects in Cleveland, came a social worker. My first job was in their housing project for seven years. Then from then on, think about the other choices you made. I said, I never wanted an administrative job or desk job. I said, work with child abuse, senior abuse. I work with homeless. I work with people yeah. who are in recovery with, with veterans in trouble, homeless vets. And I said, pre-release centers. I said, I've always, she said, you've always chosen jobs where you're forced to work and be closer in that group. This is your lesson to learn. It's like, did, did you get chances to move up? I said, I got a chance a couple of times. I hated it. And it was back. And in my mind, I was some type of field soldier. Mm -hmm. Because I was supposed to, I didn't learn how to be close to the people then. So <laughs> I had yeah. to. Those people had to be. There were kids that sold drugs, people on drugs. You know, it was just like the list went over. Oh, and over and that like say so everybody you decided to work with because you didn't learn that you said as a joke you might have been a king somewhere it's just like you didn't get along with the people now you have to be close with them so it wasn't wow 
you know, taking that, that theory and, and bringing it to myself, right. I never grew up ever thinking I'm going to be a soldier. I, I became a soldier out of couldn't find a job, you know, all the way through high school, I was going to be a professional football player, you know? And, and then when I realized that wasn't going to happen, I decided I was going to be a criminal psychologist. And then I realized you have to be smart for that too. And so that didn't work either, you know? And so I, I couldn't afford college and I ended up going in the military. And, and if you was to ask me the things that I have done in my life are things that I have never in my life ever grew up thinking I was going to do. I never thought I was going to go in the military. I never knew I was going to be deployed for 68 months. I never knew I was going to lead to writing a book about it. And, the, you know, I have a bunch of English teachers that would laugh if I told them I wrote a book right now. You know, they, they, I was not that student. <laughs> so it is, it is weird because these are all things that I did not think about doing. But it's a path that I was put on. And each of those steps led to it. So if I didn't plan this, you can't tell me that everything I'm doing right now, it had to have been planned by somebody. It might not have been me, but somebody planned it. It's not fate. And right. I think I, I think that goes to show the theory of <coughs> you do plan your whole life, you know? So, and dreams fascinate me. They really do. Um, at the end of the day, I, I believe that when you are dreaming, you are reaching somewhere else. Your mind is, is connected to something. Um, maybe not always, maybe things that happen during the day or your life or whatever can, can also play a role in that but sometimes you have dreams and then then it happens you, you see it happening and then it does happen you know there's a lot of things that i feel like touches another part of your whether it be your soul or another part of your mind that we don't use and it's fascinating to me when you start analyzing people's dreams, you know, but there is definitely another, there's more to it than just, Oh, that's just your mind unwinding, you know, excuse me. Oh, you're good. So I think, I think if you, you get all these people around, right. And, and I didn't know you before this episode and, 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 and the people that we're talking to are completely different, but some of what they're saying is, yeah. some of the things they're describing are the same you know and i'm a firm believer if you got enough people saying the same thing well they're not probably not all lying so yeah i think i think we're on to something um and i do believe in energy because there's too many <coughs> There's too many unexplained things that aren't necessarily psychic. For example, we'll take uh, you're you're in the military and you're out on a mission, right? Uh -huh. There is tons of decision making processes that are happening. Step here, don't step there. Go into this building, go left or right. None of them, you know the outcomes, right? But that, that gut feeling that you get that says, I shouldn't be here, I should be there. And then you see something happen in that spot that you were thinking about going and change your mind. Um, that feeling that somebody's in the room with you, um, like, like you were talking about, you know, those types of things come way deeper than just intuition, you know. That that is is your body reaching out and feeling different types of energy, 
and and saying, hey, I shouldn't be here. Almost a warning sometimes. Yes, absolutely. You know, um, and, and I've had that happen quite a bit. You know, there was a lot of times I was not far from mortar rounds that had came in. And had I walked a different path or had I went to the bathroom at a time before, you know, uh, <laughs> building get hit. So I, I do believe in it. And there's a lot to it that, that we can't explain. But there is something there. Um, I don't know about UFOs because... I mean, I do believe in them, but I don't know as if what everybody is talking about, especially with the government now and Congress talking about them as much. I don't know if that's what we're talking about. There is zero chance that we are the only planet inhabited. But mm-hmm. but I don't necessarily believe in the, the little green men and, and the aliens and, and that type of stuff. Um. But there's something. There's something out there. And uh, I do think eventually we'll figure that out. But uh, let's get into a little bit with your book. Where did the decision to actually become an author and start writing um, about the paranormal come from? Uh, Even before that, the first book I wrote... It's a social work book, and you can also find it on Amazon. I wrote it with a gentleman named Alan Huff, and it's called Style Over Substance, a Critical Analysis of an African-American Teenage Subculture. And Mm -hmm. I wrote that as a young social worker. Um, We were going to conferences, and we were working with that group of kids. And that was my first, first job for seven or eight years and stuff. And I was even assigned in a high school that I graduated from, you know, mm-hmm. like, like you said, the things you wouldn't believe that would happen. Yep. I remember as an old teacher in there that was there when I was there, um, when I graduated from high school and I was there and I was doing it, I was doing outreach in the high school as a social worker three days a week in there, mm-hmm. Monday, Wednesday and Friday. So I walk past him, and a supple looks at me and says, Mills, are you still in high school? And I said, yeah, <laughs> one more credit, and I'm out of here. I was like, one more credit, and I'm out of here. You know, you're done when you're done. And he was like, you're dumb. I was thinking to myself, you know. Yeah. He, he believed I was still a student until one day he saw me in the teacher's lounge getting coffee. <laughs> and he said, what the hell are you doing? I was like, I'm getting a cup of coffee. He said, oh, you're out of here. Now it's criminal for you to be here. You know, so you're out of here. I was, one of the teachers told him, you know, he's a social worker here. And he said, yep. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it because I, like you, I was going to do something else. Yeah. I was going to do something else that had a lot more money involved in it. Yeah. But I know how to path and I even... It was easy for me to be licensed in Ohio because I could not be grandfathered in. I was one of the first people to take the test mm-hmm. when they said be licensed now. I don't remember the test and passed it in the upper percentile and mm-hmm. got my license. You no, know, first first thing out. Never take the test again and stuff, you know. And the funny thing is when I was asking one of the professors, I was like, they did this test. And I said, you know, I'm in trouble and stuff. I said, can you get the, they had a teaching manual on and stuff. I said, the clinical stuff drives me crazy. So it was like, yeah, um, well, I said, ask you one of your colleagues for the teacher's manual and they didn't get it. You know, the teaching manual, what they were going to ask you. I like to remember mm-hmm. there's a hundred questions. And I remember that professor told me, you need to calm down. You've been doing this for two years, right? Two and a half years, been a social worker for two and a half years. And said, okay look at it and who is geared and who they wrote it for. Not social workers who look like you, but to say, you know, make the decisions other social workers would make, you know, in that line and stuff. 
give yourself a different name in the day. She said, take a shot of something. You drink? Yeah, I said, drink a little Jack Daniels. I said, take a shot of that before the test. So I had the number two pencil and said, you know, because we had to drive down to Columbus to take it. Mm-hmm. Hey, Cleveland. So the night before, me and another colleague drove there and stuff, and we got rooms and stuff. So we had taken the lobby of a, I think it's a Holiday Inn, is where everybody's watching with the number two pencil. They could do it online now. I'm telling my age, they could do it online, yeah. get the results immediately. Oh, the number two pencil and stuff. But I took a shot of Jack Daniels because it had like a pint of it and a tick. Another shot, and another shot, and literally. <laughs> When I got there, my colleague was saying, it's like, hey, Miss So-and-so. And she's like, oh, my God, you're drunk. I said, no, I'm not drunk. I said, did you eat something? I said, no. I was like, uh, take the test, you know. <laughs> they did, they did test, think it to myself. And I kid you not, I fell asleep like on Quest of 75. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <I> guess. <laughs> and the guy next to me tapped me and said, hey, wake up. And I was like, look at your own paper. <laughs> we get back i sleep on the ride back and stuff she knows i'm too drunk to drive so <laughs> i'm mad at the professor that told me i was like the doctor so and so i know i felt the test you told me to, i'm telling you to get drunk i told you to take a swig or something to your nerves <laughs> like, we can't back get, the test, get the test and stuff you know I passed the person that went with me that was sober as hell fell me. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. You did not pass. You were drunk. <laughs> you were drunk. I was. So everything that conspired for it to happen and me to be in that line of work always did. Yeah. And I don't know how, because it was what I chosen to do. Yep. The lesson to learn. Yep. So everything conspired and worked out that way, you know. I said I was licensed, I was LSW, <laughs> my college thing. So, <laughs> but I was <clears throat> every time I was working with those groups in the field, always. Yeah. Because I wasn't comfortable anywhere. Because somewhere in my mind, it was that's what I had chosen to do. But we and that, and that's what I think. I think. Not only that, also what we talked about reincarnation. When do you recall yourself and your mission is finished? I believe people know and people that have been assassinated, this was what I was supposed to do, that's it. You know, they had to go into history, Lincoln, Martin Luther King. That's it. This stay in the line for me, you know. King knew it in the speech. He's like, I'm not going to be there with you. Is this as far as I go? You know, wow. this was what I was supposed to do. Yeah, I'm going, you know? Yeah. And check yourself out. I think that, but, but when they, we, angels, when I start talking about angels and I start thinking about right now, it came from, I worked this other job and I, I late at night and stuff and then that, that was with child protective services you get the police kicking doors during the crash but Did I lose you they yeah um, as far as the, so, I was watching this at these prayer cloths, put his hands in there, but a picture went. Yeah, so he said some type of incantation or something that, that you send him $5, you're going to send his prayer cloth back. You know, they heal you and protect you and all this. And I said, <laughs> that's a bunch of bull, you know, I'm thinking, that's a bunch of bull. And I was saying, but people have been known to heal other people and miracles have happened. And I was like, you know, and I said, how would we really react with a miracle and how would you be in this modern day, be able to explain it 
or would you hide it? Would you, if you had the power to heal somebody, would you hide it? And I was like, no. With everything that's going on, you know, you might create a scene around you. Oh, what, what if ordinary people got this power? And that's why I got the idea to write that book. You know, and I was like, oh, okay, you know, so that'd be an interesting thing, you know, and then start getting the ideas and writing down notes and everything. And it was, it was maybe three or four years to get it to get together, you know, to do that. I thought I always had a vivid imagination growing up so I could do that. And well, I said, you, you I know, wanted I, to be ordinary people. I don't think you're far off from that. I, I really don't. You know, That's what? if you if you think about what you what you just said, would would you give if in today's world? I mean, now today's world is crazy. Would you tell anybody about a gift like that? And originally in my head, I mm -hmm. said, yes, mm -hmm. I would. But then then you have to ask yourself, well, how does that change your life? Can you heal people while they're shooting at you because they think you're the devil or or whatever is is going on out there? You know, just because there's so many people out there right now that just they don't believe in in anything. You know, and when something unexplained like that comes, it seems like any big news article just throws this country in in a turmoil. And I don't know that now would be mm -hmm. a good time to to announce a gift like that. Um, I still would. I would still help people. <coughs> Think of all the sick that. people that want to touch you, you know, or we want you to. Yeah. You know, you would have to use the gift. Yeah, that is a bit of horror to you. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, I mean, and, and what would it do to an ordinary person? I, man, that's a tough question because mm -hmm. if it, if, if that person was a ordinary good person, meaning they genuinely cared about their neighbors and stuff like that, I think it would be a great gift. But you give that same gift to, I don't know, a guy that's became a CEO of a company. And I would have to guess that the odds go down that that gift gets used for the same good versus self wealth and self growth and power and, and everything else. Um, you know, you, you ask yourself and, and, and I'm not a political person. I, I tell everybody I'm politically homeless, but you have to ask yourself if, if an ordinary person like me or you was given that gift, I think the odds are higher that we would use it to help somebody. than if that gift was given to say a president, a congressman or, or somebody like that, that, that power is, is needed for their positions. I just don't know that uh, I just don't know that everybody would use it for the right purposes. And that's what I was thinking when I saw that minister, I was like, if you really had that gift, you wouldn't want anybody to know. And you charge them five dollars for a strip of prayer cloth that you say to heal them? I was like, yes. yeah. He doesn't have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, if you really did, you probably would go to hospitals. And touch people, heal them when they didn't know it. Yeah. And leave. Yep. You know, I would think it, you'd want to be kind of quiet about it, you know? Yeah. But I, yep. I give three different versions of it, uh, three different stories with ordinary people in there. And mm -hmm. my thoughts about just kind of like, you know, and it's a fictional book. That's what I would think. But angels have always been... And, They've been very interesting to me because if you believe in the Christian Bible and you Genesis is that let us make man. So they were there before us. Mm -hmm. <coughs> 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 Excuse me. 
excuse me, I'm still getting over to COVID, but they were there before us. And um, <coughs> and I said, um, God made them before us because they're sitting there with him, you know? Yep. No, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Creator, yeah, according to the Christian Bible. And they have super strength. <laughs> <coughs> um, great warriors, messengers, and I said, you know, they're they're kind of a contradictory in themselves and stuff. And he's given them the gift to decide: do you want to be here with, with me or not? Yeah. <laughs> free will. Yeah. You know, just like we're given free will, they're given free will. And I thought it was a very interesting contradiction for anything. So I, I had to give it being like that free will. Then we find out that the the watchers in the book of Enoch, one of the apocryphs taken out. So because when I was going to church, a little boy, the minister would say, <coughs> David slew Goliath. And, it was ex- and I was like, so there was giants then. He said, yeah, giants are everywhere. Then. I was like, where did they come from? They were just there. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. No, you took out the book of Enoch. Yeah, the book of Enoch explains. There's this group of, because there's tiers of angels called the Watchers. <coughs> they were supposed to come down, teach men about the planet. You know, when yeah. the plant, and when to do certain things, they came down, they saw women, they took them for themselves. <coughs> they yeah. made it with women and they had children. And they were half angelic beings and the children grew to be giants, ate the fat of the land, ate the men. They also taught men things they shouldn't have taught them, meteorology, <coughs> astrology, um, you know, <coughs> I'm sorry, makeup, but, um, <coughs> and, God had disapproved these things. <coughs> they knew they were going to be in trouble. So they yeah. went to Enoch, who was a prophet. <coughs> when you look in Genesis, you have begat, 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 and Enoch yep. is in there. So they want Enoch to make the case for them to God. So God won't punish him. Enoch is a prophet. He does sit the chance to talk with God. And he makes a case for the watchers. And God's not hearing it and say it's done. Okay. They're going to be, you know, cast into the ground and everything and stuff covered up, you know, until the end of days. So he said, what about their children? <laughs> The giants that are running around there, you know, said, don't worry, your great, great grandson will take care of that, which is Noah with the flood. So there is the giants. Where are they now? And it explains that because most ministers weren't going to read the books they took out. So it explains yeah. that to me. But as a kid, I want to know where the giants go. Where are they at? You know, yeah. they were there. So, but they wouldn't read any other types of text. So. And that showed that that angels had, had this free will and they could decide to be a God or not, you know. Mm-hmm. And we know that because people, you know, they're afraid of angels, you know, having free will. We know that they said there was an angel that turned bad and was the leader of the other angels, the Morning Star, Lucifer. Yep. Uh, yeah. So, and he took a third of the angels with him. So, but 
I thought it was very interesting when I was reading that and research. I said, you know, they could angels can have free will. And I even created created a character in the book and the second and the, and the second one in Good Intentions and the story Good Intentions that was a fallen angel, you know. And uh, and that character is in there, and he was the angel of disease and pestilence. So, but taking that, that's when you know my little stuff for angels and I had people in there. And but like I said, my as far as religion, I tell people I'm no religion. And most people say, so you don't believe in God. And I said, no, nah, no, nah, that's not this I said, this is too perfect. You know what do you mean it's too perfect? I said it couldn't happen from evolution. So what do you mean it couldn't happen from evolution? I said we're on our, our bodies are seventy percent water. We're on a rock seventy percent water. Um, we breathe out carbon dioxide, plants take in carbon dioxide and breathe in, breathe out oxygen. We take in oxygen. Um, we're an animal that should be not top of the food chain, but we're an apex predator and we can kill any animal on this planet. We want to fly faster than any animal, swim faster than any animal in our machinery. Uh, we need to be entertained. We dream. I said, so it makes no sense to me. And I said, everything, we're on a rock that has one of the most perfect moons ever. Yeah. You know, most moons are not like that. And there's only one. And I said, and it's reflecting from the sun just right to light up the night. It goes around the earth in 28 days. A woman's cycle is 28 days. (laughs) I said, just what just happened to the eclipse. They kept saying over and over with the eclipse. They said, well, how is the moon able to block out the sun? They said, well, because the, the sun is 400 times larger uh, than the moon, but it's 400, uh, it's what is uh, 400 times further away than the moon. The numbers are even and even. I'm saying even yeah. and even. 24 days uh, <laughs> I mean, 24 hours, you know, for us to circle yep. and turn around. 24 hours in a day, 365 days a year and stuff, even up and stuff, there's one. I said, it's just too perfect. It's too perfect. We're on a rock that's not too cold, not too hot, not too far away from the sun. Yeah. Uh, we need sunlight, you know. To create certain minerals in our body. I don't like it. It's just, and I said, if this happened by evolution, do you know mathematically the amount of things that would have to happen in sequence for yeah. us to get here? And I said, and if that's true, it happened in linear sequence. This would happen, 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 this would happen. And linear sequence, where's to get here? I said, now I said, creator, I don't know exactly what god is i don't think it's a human being yeah like you said energy i think it's yep. energy it's everywhere it's a, somebody had I had on the show they had a near-death experience and uh she said you know she asked where is god they said everybody always asks that here <laughs> they, they laughed at her here right now you know where is god yeah and I would just, Lucas had in his mind with the force. It's in you, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. And in it, everything, it's like, you know. Yeah. And somebody blew my mind and said, what God wants to know is what it's like to be you right now, right here, doing this. I said, so the creator wants to learn? Yes, what it is to be you right here, right now. I mean, hell, just but that since, and I believe too, if you start putting aliens in it, it would mess up certain religions. God created man in his own image. Yeah. We're thinking of physical image, but we're made of particles. Yeah. We're thinking of, people think constantly of a physical. And 
I was like, you know, that don't make any sense. Somebody told me it didn't make any sense. I said, it don't make any sense there wouldn't be any other intelligent beings on other planets. Yeah. Uh, that the creator didn't stop making one type of ant. On this planet, there's many, many different types of ants. Yeah. One type of fly, one type of mosquito, one type of, I said, but smart enough to, the creator is smart enough to know that men should be spread out just like ant, like ants in different ant tribes, you know, give me miles away different types of ants and stuff. Because we're technically all the same type of human being. We don't get along now. I think he was going to put it, you know, <laughs> different species of men Yeah, on the same planet. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think well, so. I mean, absolutely. I, I believe the not government's gonna... not telling us and they've already made contact. I, I would agree with that. I, I'd, I'd agree with that too. And I also agree a hundred percent that it would not go well if, if contact came for everybody to see, right. Our government is not going exactly. to approach it. like, Hey, how are you doing? We just want to be friends. There's going to be an attack for mm -hmm. why? Because you're afraid. I mean, just because you're afraid doesn't mean the person that is doing something has bad intentions. You know, um, lots of times you open up a door and there's somebody right there about to grab the door at the same time and it scares you. doesn't mean that person was doing anything intentionally. And that is not going to go over well when you're not the superior force. <laughs> you know, I think about all the time in the past when you look at history and the government knows that. Right. Right. Yeah. Every every time in the past when somebody's come over with superior technology to another land, it didn't do well for the indigenous people. It did not. <clears throat> if they land, we know immediately if they came and they jump wormholes to get here light years away, the technology is already superior. Yeah. We know that. We could barely struggle in and get to the moon. We know that right away. Yeah. And I tell people, I said, they, I believe they have already contacted the govern the our government's heads. And they the thing is, they're not ready for it. They're speaking for us. They're not ready for you. Because the worst thing they would they want is them to have a discussion with you or I, average person. Yeah. Because they want to know, what did you tell them everything? When I watched it, Betty and Barney Hill and I had the niece on my show and stuff, and she was telling the story, captured the Betty and Barney Hill story. She said, you know, Barney was out on the, they had him out, but she was walking around and she asked them questions. Where are you from? And then they said, showed her a star chart. They said, where are you from on here? And she said, I don't know. And they said, why should I tell you where we're from? You don't know where you are on here and stuff. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, they didn't. And somebody would be like, right here, is this our sun? We're like this third planet rotating around the sun here. The Milky yeah. Way galaxy, you know, they'd be able to tell them and they'd be able to say where they were from. But uh, um, that's where we get Zeta Reticuli because they put her on the hypnosis and she is able to redraw that. And they said, no star system exists. Hey, a a little astronomer from Cleveland and it's like that did a part-time astronomy a school teacher found that when the technology caught up and say here it is and matched it up there say the reticulia wow. so she found it later <clears throat> and they had no plans of telling anybody anything that happened to him and she asked him for a book one of the helpers there workers she said can I have that book she said no Nobody will believe I was on here. They wanted to give it to her, but the taller alien said no. I think the government is afraid we get information that we shouldn't have, information they already know. And they said, because you got to throw it off. Because people in power, and somebody was talking to say, that don't make any sense. Why would they do it? I said, 
can you go up and speak to another person, uh, a national uh, prime minister of another country? Not you. They expect to speak to your other. And they, they made it so you can't really talk to them. <laughs> they don't want you yeah. talking to them about America. This is, yeah. I said, what's uh, um, the prime minister of Japan was just here. I said, can I call him up? And, can I call him up? No. It's a meeting you got to go to and stuff. But you're not going to be sitting alone with him talking to him. You might get to say two things with the media around, a media blitz and stuff. You're not going to be sitting alone talking with any heads of state because yep. they did that. That's power. That's power. I got to keep you away from talking to anybody in power. Because yep. you got to go through me to go through this. You got to be here. You got to be senator. You got to be president. You got to be another prime minister. And then you got to go through because we don't want to give away power. And the worst thing is you could talk to them. You got information. Because when they're saying it didn't exist, they always had men in black show up at your door asking questions. What did you see? Yeah. What did you what, if it's not sure, I got to answer if aliens don't exist, but there's always some government officials asking you, what did you say? What did you see? What happened? Yeah. <laughs> Cause it's like meeting somebody from another planet and talking to them. Did they give you anything that you say? You know? yep. And that's the scary thing that you're talking to them alone, you know, and you get information. Yeah. Well, and again, I believe they already know, and they got a lot of information. Yeah. And, and you can't control the amount of people that the government controls without power. You have mm -hmm. to, you have knowledge away exactly. from, from those people, you know, in order to be able to keep them at bay, you know, um, if, if they didn't believe that you could protect them and, and if aliens were landing here, they're going to, we're going to believe that you can't protect us mm -hmm. and they're going to lose everything. So, and God, for, for, for being, they were friendly, they talked to you and they gave you something. Yeah. They didn't yeah. give the what president, you, anybody head of state, they gave you something to say, this will help you. You know, you, you got this disease. Oh, we got this. We'll give you this. It gave you something. That'd be the worst thing in the world. They didn't talk to the president. They talked to the yeah. senators. They yeah. gave you something or they told the, you something. You know, their egos would never take that. <laughs> right. That's it. It's like it's not. Um, I believe they're probably they would the fear scientifically is they have cures for diseases and stuff. That that would be horrible. Yeah. That would be horrible. And they and they shared it with you. <laughs> And yeah. I said, I don't want to put any, I don't want to put any bad exertions on, on medicine and science, but this is what I'll say. And people can judge for themselves. Um, there's a president that said that we're going to fight a war. We're going to fight a war on polio, FDR. He did it January 3rd, 1938. Polio vaccine was available then in 1955, 17 years later in 1953. 17 years, years and he was collecting dimes. He was collecting dimes. And we didn't have Big Pharma then. Jonas Salk was kind of working with a little ragtag team. He didn't even patent it. So you eradicated literally a disease from North America, you know, that everybody was afraid of and went in the top 10 and stuff. And you just did that and stuff. Now, there was another president that said, you know, we're going to fight a war on cancer. He said that in 1971. That was Nixon. Yeah. 53 years ago. It's that we're not even close to curing cancer because yeah. I mean, I tell people, my mom died of cancer. I said, look at what happened. I said, you eradicated something. And I said, that was the worst business model ever. Because the money is really in 
treating the symptoms. Yep. Treating the symptoms. The money is in there not curing anything. It's treating the symptoms, making it easier for us and stuff like that. And and if you do treat something, it's got to be something that you're going to be on it forever. And I said, you look at Ozempic right now. Yep. I said, oh, yeah, it's going to make you skinnier and stuff, but you got to be on it forever. <laughs> Might even cure some other things at $1,000 a pop. Yeah. So they looked at that immediately and said, that's a bad model because <laughs> March of Dimes had to turn into another organization. It had to turn into another organization because it put itself out of business. But that's what yeah. we really will want medicine to do. Put itself out of business. <laughs> yeah. But that's not the way that the money yeah. is in the medicine to treat things, you know, so and constantly treat them. You want to sell it. Yeah. Olympic is like, they said, touchdown. You got to use it forever. Go. So. Yep. And that's a big, the government keeps secrets, money, power, wealth. Yeah. One percent yep. of the the plant, one percent of this planet owns the bulk of the wealth. Yeah. Exactly. And and that's where the big fight between cryptocurrency and American dollar is, is because they can control the dollar with inflation. You know, inflation doesn't have to be a real thing, but without it, it makes it easier for a lot of other people to build wealth. I, and it's just, uh, there was a, I love Star Trek because Star Trek had, the, they saw a lot of stuff in the future. They saw a lot of stuff in the future. You know, in Captain, they had flat screens on there. Flat mm-hmm. screens in the cities. Avor had a Bluetooth in their ear. Yeah. They had flip phones. There was a communicators. <laughs> I said when they gave they gave Kirk something to sign off, guess what they did? They gave him an iPad. He did it like this. Get back to yep. him. So they saw a lot of things in the future. And I love Star Trek the Next Generation. And one of my favorite episodes was the, uh, called The 300 Years on Star Trek the Next Generation. Um there were a group of people that came from the 20th century. They're in a cryogenic state. And one was a millionaire, one was a housewife, one was a musician. And um, they said, you know, they kept, um, <coughs> the millionaire kept telling, you know, I got to talk to the captain. I'm a very rich man. You know, I'm a billionaire. And he was like, you know, I, I got to talk to the captain and get the home and stuff, you know. And it's like, uh, you know, and Kirk was busy. I mean, uh, Picard was busy with some other stuff. Finally, he had talked to him and he said, you know, I need to get back to Earth and stuff. And he was like, and, you know, Picard had told him, he said, you know, he said, just, I got a lot of money waiting. And he told him, he said, uh, we don't use that anymore. And he said, we've grown out of our embassy. We've eradicated hunger and want. People are no longer obsessed with with the accumulation of things. <laughs> and he told him, he said, it's never been about the possessions. It's been about the power to control your destiny. And he told Picard, and, he said, and Picard told him control is illusion. He said, is it? He said, really? I should be dead, but I'm here. <laughs> Even then, you know, <laughs> no money. He said, he paid his way. Whatever that disease was, they cured it. Yeah. He paid yeah. his way to be there, but there's no more money. So it's more like, you know, once we found out that there's people from everywhere, <laughs> other planets and stuff, and just uh, us and stuff, we had to get yeah. ourselves together. We had fought a war, we had to get ourselves together and stuff, you know, there <laughs> and catch up. But it was like, still with him being back in the 20th it's about power money yeah Yeah. and yeah and it will be until that that does go away um i do believe one day people will be reunited again and and conversations will be happening and people know their neighbors again um i believe that because history does tend to repeat itself and we used to be that way and so i don't think things will always stay negative like they are now where so many people are wrapped up in their phones and and everything else so i do believe at some point um 
just like they said, we don't use money anymore. People quit going after materialistic things. They started interacting with each other and knowing other people. And I think that's important. So I'd like to see that. I'd like to see that day come. I would too. But like you said about history, those that don't learn from it are condemned to repeat it. Yeah, you are right. You are right. This really is giving us warnings. And we could be condemned to repeat it if we don't learn from it. That is true. Yeah, yeah that is true. If I started a nuclear weapon, nobody could win. You, yeah, you were right. You were absolutely right. And and I think, again, we talk about not learning. Well, here we are again, going from the 80s, worried about Russia launching nuclear weapons. You know, we ain't had that problem since the 80s. And now we're right back there again. How did the, how did we not learn from that? You know. Well, brother, I appreciate you coming on, man. I had an amazing conversation. Um, you gave me you gave me some things I'm gonna I'm gonna write about and think about because uh, you made some really valid points that I didn't really think of. So I appreciate that. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the opportunity. I'm gonna bring you forward and let you see and say where they can follow you places that they can find your other books and, and this book. Um, and then just let the world know where, where they can reach out and find you. Okay. Um, healers by Ron Mills. You can find healers, three tales of, uh, miracles, angels, and lost souls by Ron Mills. You can find on Amazon, uh, Barnes and Nobles, uh, all types of bookstores. Uh, uh, Walmart sells it. Everywhere you go, I do have a, a novella um, <coughs> that's Kindle and paperback for healers. I do have a novella that's strictly on a uh, Kindle, and it's ninety nine cents. And it's called Island Alien, and it's about an alien abduction and reabduction. So that's very interesting, and it's for children and teens and. Uh, Adults too. It's, it's novella is forty nine pages, very easy read. Um, so those are the places you get the book. You still find style of substance, critical analysis of African American teenage soul culture. That's on Amazon or African American images books. Uh, they still sell them. I still think so. But take a look at them. I appreciate it. Appreciate the time. Uh, it's done. Thank you for having me. Hey, I had a great time, man. I love these conversations because you learn so much about other people. So I had a great time. I appreciate you coming on. I'm going to go and throw you in the green room real quick. If you don't mind holding on for a second, I'll throw the exit video and I'll be right with you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Man, I, I hope y'all got a little bit out of this because I got a lot out of it. I'm going to tell you, it is ironic how many things from podcasting that I've spoke to other people that turned out to be things that he was told as well. Um, you look at, at the, the way he talked about the creator. I mean, I completely agree with that um, philosophy as well. So, but at the end of the day, like I, I said, until we die, we will not know. And so I want all y'all to be safe. I appreciate all of y'all listening. Y'all take care. Remember, don't let the day kick your ass. Kick the day's ass.